Well, welcome. A lot of you uh, are visiting in. I'm glad you're here with us. A lot of people I've been finding visit us on the internet, so hello to them. In fact, everyone turn around and wave to them. <laughs> See? Friendly. So, um, yeah, it's are goofy. That's what you do in junior high. Yeah. So be nice to them. So anyway, glad you're with us. We're, we're uh, going through Romans, and we're studying the book of Romans, and it's a fascinating book. By the way, should we open some doors for airflow? Do you need some air? Okay, so if someone, if someone just pushes that open, it'll stay open, and we need to prop a brick on the one in the front door just to keep it open. Hey, Dave, you want to prop open the front door, and there's a brick there to stick under it? Yeah, that'd be just great. I know. Yeah, so we will get road noise. Yeah, we'll try that. It is motorcycle season. I just saw some go by, so maybe that's... Yeah, they'll be here any second, so <laughs> it's, it's, uh, we'll see how it happens. Oh. That should stay open if you just push it all the way. Push it all the way, 90 degrees, it should stay open, yeah. Yeah. Life of the church, this is great stuff. Does it, does it stick? There we go, okay. We'll see what that does. <coughs> and if it still doesn't cool off, we'll pick someone to wave a palm frond. Can you feel it? Okay. Well, let's get back to this. Okay, so we're in Romans, and uh, let, me, let me just recap where we are in Romans, because we're turning a big corner today, big, big corner today, and the topic is going to move a little bit. So let me, let me just review again. We're looking at Romans, and I'm calling it simply Romans, because a lot of people are intimidated by Romans. They don't think it's really humanly possible to digest what the book says, but it really is very digestible. So uh, simply Romans, here's the eight chapters that we're going to study this, just this year. We decided just to do these between January and uh, June of this year. So we're going to do eight chapters, and then next, the beginning of next year, we'll do the other uh, up through chapter 15. So let me just review really quickly. When he starts off in chapter 1, he starts off with this thing that's basically, hello, 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 I have great news for you. And he uses the good news thing several times in the beginning of the book. Uh, without really telling us what the good news is, he tells us he's got good news, which is a great thing to do if you're writing a novel, entice people at the beginning, make them wonder what that is, and wait them wait for it to happen. And we've been looking at the good news. So that's how he starts it off. That's where, in fact, that's the section where he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. So he's saying not only is the gospel a great thing, but I'm not ashamed of it. I just, I just love it. And that word ashamed doesn't mean like we think ashamed, whereas, you know, you do something sinful and you feel ashamed. This is actually, the opposite of shame is boastful and proud kind of in a sense. So instead of going, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't want to do that. That's a shame thing. He's saying, woo-hoo, woo the gospel, oh, I'm not ashamed. So it's not a really big word, but that's what he means. So he boasts about it and he revels in it and he's just excited about it and here it comes. But... Then he switches gears at the end of chapter 1 and into chapter 2 and 3 and he says we've got to contrast this with the bad news because good news is not good until you understand the bad news. And the bad news from the last half of 1 and all through 2 and half of 3 is the state of mankind. It goes from 118 to 320. And the state of mankind is all have sinned without exception. No preference for anybody. Jews don't have an extra edge over Gentiles. Everybody has sinned, and everybody is incapable of getting out of that sin. Well, that's bad news. <laughs> and he talks a lot about that. So we get that figured out. Our situation is separated from God. There's a, basically a war going on with God because of our rebellion. We're all in this boat. No one has any extra advantage over anybody else. All have sinned. We're stuck. We're stuck. So that's what he spends that about. And then he transitions into the good news. And the good news... Uh, it goes from the last of three all the way through eight. And, uh, and the good news actually is the fact that God offers life with him. So there is life, there is good news, and it's all coupled with us being with God himself. God's the source of life. And that's what he's trying to get at in this second half. But wait a second, the bad news is, is we're all stuck in sin and alienated from God. Yes, the good news is there's still life from God. So how do you fix this? Well, he starts off this good news section, and we've been looking at this in the end of three, four, and five, with the fact that we've been made right with God. And that phrase, made right with God, is shrunk down into one very technical religious word called justification. So when you hear justification, that's all it means. It's we're made right with God. So the things that offended God, that separated us, now have been made right. And in this section, he doesn't say it's according to what you have done. 
It's according to what he has done. So here's the alienation, the bad news, the stuck in sin. We can't get close to God and all life comes from God. What's the solution? Christ himself is the solution. And that's what we've been looking at for the last several weeks. Uh, really good news. And then he transitions into 6, 7, and 8. And he talks about what life is like with God after that happens. And this is where we talk about the being transformed by God. So the first part of the good news is the instantaneous declaration of our righteousness and made right with God. The initiation, the entry into this life with God, as you were. And then the last part of it, so what is life like now that the relationship with God has been fixed? What is life like us like right now? Now that we're justified because of what Christ has done once for all, the just for the unjust. So now, Monday morning, what do I do? And that's where 6 goes into that section where, where basically what do you do now that you know you're justified and you're reconciled with God? How does life change now, not when you die? So it's very practical. Rubber meets the road. And so we are, boop, right there. We're at the beginning of chapter 6 today. And this, so this is a significant change. He's going to change from how we enter into this relationship in 4 and 5, being made right with God, and he's going to move to, so now life with God is like this. In fact, the keystone verse from that first, that yellow section in 4 and 5, the instantaneous, comes at the beginning of Romans 5. He says, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, justified, made right with God, since we've been justified by faith, oh, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Okay, that's a mouthful, and if you weren't with us when we studied that verse, <laughs> go back and watch it or reread it. I mean, there's a lot there. But what's interesting about this, you see, it, you see a transition coming because he's talking about this grace in which we stand. See that? This grace in which we stand right now, like today, like Monday morning, I'm standing in this. So that's why he's changing, he's changing the emphasis from how we start the relationship with God, where life is, justification, to what's like after that with God. And there's a lot of practical questions that come up with that. And that's what he's going to start with today. Practical questions. And he starts off in Romans 6, that's where we are, with the question. So, what shall we say then? And this is, this is a device for you to vote. So in a second, we're going to vote. We hate when we vote, don't we? Gosh, i got to tell people next to me what I think. And what if I'm wrong? I'll go home just horrified and humiliated. And, and everyone will look at me and say, what's your problem? But you don't learn unless you vote. So you ready? Boast your courage, here we go. So what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer is, okay, wait. So you're either going to say yes or no to this. Ought, ought we to continue? Because he just told us, he just told us in the end of five, that there is so much grace, even though there's so much sin, there's more grace than there is sin, which means all the sin is covered. And if that's the case, if there's plenty to go around in grace to cover the sin, then that means there's a little bit of wiggle room and I can sin all I want and still be covered by grace. So, you ready to vote? So, all those who think that we should continue to sin so that grace may abound, raise your hands. All those that think, no, we shouldn't continue in sin, that grace may abound. All those who are too chicken to commit, Well, you're right. So, the answer is by no means. Verse 2. Ta-da! We're done. Let's go home. <laughs> but actually, it, it reveals something troubling. And this is why he's getting into this. I mean, here we are now, justified by faith. The relationship with God is fixed. There's sufficient grace to cover any amount of sins we've ever done. That's cool. God provides that. But tomorrow, I'm probably going to sin. So let's get practical. How does this work? And, and I, know, I know already it's stupid to say I should, I should actually push this and sin more. I mean, I, or, or you can just you can soften a little bit and say, well, since everything's fixed with God and there's no penalties with God from now on out, it really doesn't matter what I do tomorrow. I can do a mixture of good and bad. It's like, hey, I'm, I'm free. I can do anything I want to. Woo well, that's not right either. So the presence of sin in our lives is really where he's going to focus to right now. And, we, and he's already starting off with, it, you know, having grace enough to cover our sins is not a sufficient penalty killer to cause you to sin more. It, that doesn't make sense. Now, a lot of, uh, for a lot of years, I read this verse. 
And I said, who would ever think this <laughs> until I moved to Utah? <laughs> and then I was accused of this a lot. That, you know, it, it'll be said, you just want to be saved by grace by saying yes to God so that you can be free to sin all you want after that. And you don't really have to moderate your actions. You can just be as bad as you want and you're covered and you get a jet, get out of jail free card and so there you go. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've read this someplace here. So no, of course the answer is no. But the answer no is not really the point. The point is, is why would you start to think like this? And what's, what's the role of sin now starting Monday in this life where we're justified with God? How does this work? So that's what he's going to talk about today. It's very practical, looking forward to what happens right now. So no, we're not done yet. Let's read what else he says. And he says some fascinating stuff that's very, very good news. How can we who died to sin still live in it? What? <laughs> oh, what? How can, okay, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Now, he's saying that since we've been justified by faith, the relationship with God is fixed. He's saying that, he's saying that, he's saying that I'm dead to sin. I died to sin. Well, I don't think so. Come check on me tomorrow. I'm still going to sin. So what does he mean died to sin? Died to sin. It clearly doesn't mean I'm not capable of sin. Because I am. And don't look at me like that. You are too. So it's not being incapable of sin, but there's something else going on here. He's trying to, he's using an idiom that's more popular in kind of Hebrew thinking than it is with us. If you've died to sin, why do you still live in it? And he's going to use this death and life thing. The, the closest I can come to, to explain this is if you, if you know anything about the Jewish community today, if in the Jewish community, and I grew up in a Jewish community on the East Coast, if you're in a Jewish community and one of your children decides to leave Judaism and become a Christian, which is like the worst thing in the world. I mean, it's really tragic. Then what the parent will say to the child is, you're dead to me. Exactly. That's, this is where you'll hear this phrase. You're dead to me. Are they really dead? No, they're not dead. What the parent is saying is, is that you have no effect on me anymore. All your appeals to me, all your, oh, please, you need to live. No, no, you're dead to me. It's as, because... Uh, it's as though a dead thing was trying to appeal. You can't make a corpse jump when you say jump. A, a, a dead thing doesn't respond. So basically what it's saying, when he says you're dead to sin, what he's saying in a Hebrew idiom is sin itself no longer is able to appeal to make you do its whim. Because you're a dead man to sin. Sin doesn't work anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't do it. But wait, I'm still capable of sinning. Uh, that's not what we're saying. And he'll, he'll, he'll broaden this in just a second. What he's saying is, is that there's no automatic jump reflex when sin says sin, because I'm dead to it. That's all he's saying. And we'll expand this in a second here. There's, there's something clearly that after being justified with God changes your relationship with sin right now. Ah, this is where it's really enticing. So let's see how he's going to do this. So if you've died to sin, that is something about your relation to sin is less responsive, then why would you choose to live in it? And that's, you know, that's the paradox of that first question. He goes on, verse 3 of 6. So don't you know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Have you ever thought of baptism that way before? I mean, when we do baptisms, which you do about once a year, you know, when it's nice and warm outside and we have a pool, but when you do it, I'm always, I'm always conscious of trying to remind you that this is a great picture. What a great opportunity this is, that as you're being placed down under the water where you can't breathe and you'll die, unless someone brings you up, when you're being placed in the water, it's like being buried and you're dead. So you're, so you're doing it. And, and so in some sense, um, metaphorically speaking, part of you is dying. And in those split seconds, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, you're wondering if you're going to live. Someone has to lift you out of that. And so that someone actually is Christ or the person who's baptized you, brings you back and you come to life. So it's really a wonderful picture of being buried with Christ and something about you dies and then bring back to new life. Something about you lives. That's, that's really what it's all about. And he's using that here. He's expanding that by saying, don't you know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ and here baptized doesn't necessarily mean water baptism. It's really the Greek word that means placed into so if you've been placed into Christ, well then, 
uh, in Christ Jesus, don't you know that you were placed into his death as well? So something about you died when Jesus died. Ah, this is very intriguing. Something about you died when Jesus died. Don't you know that you've been placed into his death? And we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. So does this mean I need to have baptism for this all to work? Actually, not technically. Baptism is a sign. It's a symbol of all this stuff. But you, but you did when you made a decision back in the last couple chapters to be justified with God and to accept the price that Jesus paid for you. When you accepted that, you placed yourself into Christ as the means to finding life. And one part of you died and another part of you found life. And what he's saying is that, that part of you that died from the beginning of this question in chapter 6, why would that thing that died come to life in sin? And that's what he's getting at. It's dead. It's dead. But, but I can still sin. I know. So quit saying that. We're going to work on that. But there's something about your relationship to sin that's died. So let's see what it is. But he goes on. If, you, if that part of you has been buried with him into death, it's in order that, and I stop right here, salvation and just be, being justified with God, something necessarily has to die in order that something will live. And this is another thing I've run into a lot. A lot of people say, well, you guys just say the sinner's prayer. Oh, God, forgive me. And from that point on, you can do anything you want to. And it's really simple and it's really easy. And it doesn't cost you anything because you don't have to change your life. It doesn't cost you anything. Well, actually, it costs you everything. And we'll talk about that in a second. Something in totality about you dies. And it's replaced by something with new life. You're not just, biblically, you're not adding something to your life. You're actually dying so that something else can replace it. It's that radical. That's what news about life with God is like. Something literally stops living so that it's totally replaced by something else. Big, it's a big, important deal. In order that what? dun 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 just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So the simple sentence is, unless this part of you dies that's associated with sin, you can't replace it with newness of life. So the Bible, the Bible and what Paul's saying here is that what we're trying to say is this new life with God is not, it's not like taking a Dale Carnegie course where you teach yourself how to improve yourself. You, know, you add it to what you are until you keep adding improvements to this model of human being that you are. And once you change and improve who you are, and I listen to who Jesus is, and I try and model who he is, and I make myself better, and I'm going, no, actually, something completely dies in who we are so that it can be completely replaced by something else. When we talk about the word repentance in the New Testament, repentance always is that big topic. It's not just to be sorry for one sin. It's really to say, I'm letting this thing die so that this thing can find life. It's really a radical 180 degree turn. I'm leaving this and I'm going to this. Repentance in the Greek in the New Testament, this word metanoia, is more like this phrase that used to be really popular 30 years ago, paradigm shifts. You know, paradigm shifts, the way you see the world, the way things are, uh, changing of your mind. I'm thinking differently now. I'm a new person. The metanoia word, meta means to come alongside something and noia means what you think. So it basically implies that somewhere in your experience you came alongside something and you looked at it and you weighed it and after you come away from being alongside of it, you're thinking different. It's a radical shift. And what is that radical shift? I come alongside what Christ says about my old life and I come away thinking differently that that is not salvageable. I need a new life. Just like Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, great rabbi, we know that you're from God because you teach great things. And Jesus stops him short and says, you know, you can't really enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again, unless you start over. It's a radical shift away from one thing that dies to something that lives. And that's what Paul's getting at here. A radical thing has happened in your life that changes your relationship to the body that you had that sinned so that it can be replaced by this body that finds life something radical and he hasn't told us yet but this is really good news because one of the things i struggle with is the presence of sin in my life I, I, and because i hate it and simultaneously do it anybody else hey a few hands honest people yeah and so that's that's a that's disturbing 
And later on, we'll see in a couple of weeks, Paul says that very thing. The very thing that I don't want to do, I'm doing it. What is up with that? So we have this. So let's talk about this because I'd like to be free of that. I'd like to somehow say, yes, I want this all to die. And I know that unless this dies, it can't be replaced with life. That's what I want. That's what I want. And that's what Paul's saying right here. That's what happens. It's radical. He goes on. Those of us who died to sin. He keeps talking about this died to sin. So let's, let's define sin a little bit for a second because we really, we underdefine sin. Like if I lied to you right now about the fact that I'm actually 6'5 and I can press 200 pounds when I... Hey, I can do... No, I can't. So if I lied to you like that, you'd say, is that a sin? Yeah, it's a sin. Is that the sin he's talking about here? Not totally. It's, it's, it's a lot bigger than that. <laughs> it's a big word. It should have a capital S, capital I, capital N. And, and let's look at it because this, by my definition, this sin is a defiant pursuit of life apart from God. So that's to say, the Creator made me. The Creator gave me all this stuff around me, wonderful food to eat. I love lobster, just in case you're thinking of bringing us to dinner. Wonderful things, blue skies. It's a, actually a very nice place. He's blessed me with breath and life and, and you know, health and so many things. I'm the beneficiary of so many things that I had no control over receiving. But I got it anyway. The grace of God in general, it comes to me. But what I say in defiance of sin is I say, hey, I don't know where all this stuff came from, but I'm going to use it. And I just prefer not to think that there's a God. <laughs> I'm going to find life all by myself apart from God. And the creator who made you says, what are you thinking? And so there's this rebellion. There's a rebellion of all mankind. That's actually what happened. That's sin. Another way that it's easily defined is if you go back to Isaiah. You go to Isaiah 53 that talks about the Messiah who died for us. This is the state of our sin. All we like sheep, which by the way, are very dumb. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, this Messiah who would die for us. So what's his definition of what was placed on Christ that was paid on our behalf? Our waywardness away from God. We've gone our own way. We've just gone our own way. We've said, God, bye. Now, earlier in Romans, in fact, in the opening of Romans, when he starts into this discussion of the bad news, you know, this pervasive sin that we're in, He says that everyone's got this disease. It's a genetic carryover from Adam. We are predisposed to sin, and no matter how much you think in your pride, you could have done better than Adam if you'd been given a chance, which is actually kind of stupid, but we have this genetic predisposition, and the first chance we get, we sin. What does that mean? We walk away from God and pursue life in any place other than God himself. And that's the natural state of mankind, trying to pursue life anywhere but God and yet the creator God is the God who says I want to give you life and I want you to enjoy me and you'll never find any life apart from me and we say I don't think so I'll do anything except be with you bye so it's really this defiant pursuit apart from God okay we're getting ready to do a, a voting thing so the question I pose to you knowing that is which phrase best describes God a bad actions a sin I'm sorry did I say God boy that's a bad thing I did that on purpose just to see if, oh, that's a lie. Oh. Okay, so which best describes sin? Okay, so get ready. You're going to have to vote. Bad actions, bad thoughts, bad path. I'm not giving you all the above. Well, you could do all the above. So we're going to vote. You ready? Here we go. A's. B's. C's a lot of chickens in this room <laughs> well actually bad actions are sins uh, you know bad thoughts are sins but in the bigger sense the capital S sin condition of man is a bad path you've chosen a path away from God to find life and tried to done it on your own with other replacements for who God is and some people choose a path of pursuing sex drugs and rock and roll some people choose a path of wealth some people choose a path. I don't know. There's just lots of paths. There's lots of false paths that people propose to us and saying, listen, if you do this, you will find life. And many times you pursue those paths and you get to the end of them 
and, and then you really get to the end of them and you get everything you can possibly get in that path and you come to the end and go, man, this wasn't it. And so in your waywardness from God because you're a dumb sheep, you try another path and you go off another way and you choose something else that's fashionable at the time and you try that and you work hard thinking when I get to the end of this, when I get to the end of this, I will finally be fulfilled and I'll finally find life and you get to the end of it and there's no life. Well, I guess I'll go another way. And you go another thing. And many people live their entire lives going from one path to another when in fact, biblically, God's very clear. If you want to find life, find me. I'm the source of life. That's why I made you. So you'd find life in me. So really, capital S, sin, is a choice of path. All we like sheep have gone astray and we've chosen our own way and God has taken that iniquity and placed it on Christ. Our waywardness away from God, saying to the Creator, Thanks for the good stuff, but I don't want you. Now, there's a good illustration of this. By the way, yeah, bad path is what I was trying to emphasize. The prodigal son, remember the prodigal son story? If you don't know it, you can read it right here. The prodigal son says to his dad, in the presence of his older brother, I want my part of the inheritance right now so I can go off and choose a path that will fulfill me, but I need the fuel of my inheritance to be able to pay for it. So dad... I don't want to live in your house anymore, but I want your cash. Now, in good Jewish culture, that kid would have been supremely disciplined, <laughs> like beaten with sticks. That's a really, it's, it is so disrespectful. Dad, I can't wait for you to die to get my half of what I want. While I'm young, I want to live. I want to do my things. I want to pursue this path that will really bring me life. I need what you have, but I don't need you. And he goes off and he does it. That's really bad. I mean, it's, I, I know it's, it's stunningly bad. And he goes off and does that. And what does he do? He spends all those resources prodigally. That's what prodigal means. He spends it just wildly until he runs out of cash. Does he have any friends? No. Does he have anything left? No. And as he's sitting in the despair of his condition, at the end of his road, fully fueled to be able to, to really realize the promise of this path for life, he realizes this was a dead end. And so he asks himself, well, I've got to live, and I'm tired of stealing food from the pigs, so maybe if I go back home to my father, he'll let me in, but I can't presume upon him that he'll let me back in as, my, as a son, because after all, <laughs> I did something really bad. I don't think he could ever forgive me. This is Jim kind of paraphrasing. You need to read it yourself. But yeah, I don't think he'd ever... So maybe if I go back, he'll accept me, and, and, I, and I'll, just, I'll just ride on the coattails of life from him because I, if I was just a servant, maybe you know, I'll get it better than pig food at least. So I'll go back and I won't presume upon anything because after all, I have, I have injured him greatly in my disrespect. So he comes back. And what does the father do? He's been waiting, looking for him on the horizon. When he sees him coming near, the father jumps up out of his chair and runs out to meet the son who had done such horrible things to his dad, saying, I want what you have, but I don't want you. And yet when he comes back, the father runs and says, but I've always wanted you, son. <sighs> it's a great story. By the way, it's a fictional story, but it's massively true of all mankind. So that's why, that's why we can identify so well with it. So, in the summary, as we're talking about sin, the prodigal son, was his sin what he did with the prostitutes with dad's cash? Well, that was bad. I'd put that in the sin category. Or was it choosing a path away from his father? That's it, actually. Choosing a path away. So very much the condition of sin that we're in, that Paul's talking about, is this condition where we consciously say to God, I don't want you, but I want your stuff. And to a creator, father, God, that is remarkably offensive. And we have enough human savvy to know. Because you read that story and you go, man, that's like Linda just said, that's really bad. <laughs> it's really bad. We get it. That's the offense. That's why there's no peace between us and God. Because we basically have said to God, eh, I'm out of here. Give me everything that you want to give me and I'll just live my life apart from you. Because I'm voting with my feet saying that there is no life with you, God. There's a life apart from you and I'm going to find it. That's sin. And that's what Adam chose and that's what we continue to choose until we're justified with God and we're brought back together. So where's the justification in the story of the prodigal son? Remember, justification means being made right with the father. When did that happen? Oh. 
Made right with the Father. <laughs> because the son had reformed himself and now was a very good person and had earned the worthiness to be able to come back to his father's household. No, he still had the mantle of this sin and of this personal offense. He did nothing. The father's the one that ran to him. And that's really, that's the biblical picture of justification. Made right with the father. And now that I'm made right with the father, why would I ever, if you were the prodigal son, why would you ever, after this happens, run back to the prostitutes? What? Isn't that life dead to you? Doesn't that have no appeal to you? It's like you're a corpse, you're a dead man, and as it appeals to you, you go, yeah, right, you're lying to me. Right? You're a dead man to that appeal. You're dead to that sin. It has no power anymore. And from that point on for the prodigal son, that stuff will still be sort of attractive, but it really has no power on him. He can say, whatever, and leave it. And this is what the good news is about life with God now. Sin has no siren appeal. It is sort of attractive. I'll give it that. But you can say, no. You actually have a choice. Remember earlier when he's talking about the bad news about mankind, he uses the word slavery when it comes to sin. Such that when slavery whispers, when sin whispers in your ear, you have to say, yes, master, I obey. And you follow it. You don't have a choice because that's, that's the condition that we inherited from Adam. When sin whispers to you, you go. You can't stop it. But now that vulnerability of the living sinful person has died with Christ. And so now that thing appeals to you and you go, no, no, that's what's changed. That no more enslaved to sin, susceptible to its siren call. Yeah, we're still susceptible. But we're wise enough after coming to have finding life with God to say, bad choice, stupid path, dead end. And that's, that's what I do. I mean, I literally say that to myself when sin whispers in my ear and says, do this, Jim. And I, and I listen to it for a while, and it looks pretty appealing, you know. Especially when, when I fail to carry through doing something I tell someone I'm going to do. So did you, did, you order those, did you order those things that we, you know, agreed? You know, you said you'd do that Monday, and then, you know, and you're thinking, oh, my gosh, I totally forgot. I forgot. So you say, well, uh, yeah. So see, the lie, is, the lie is saying to you, you need to salvage your reputation because you were a failure. So if you just tell a little lie to salvage your reputation, and then after it's done, you can cover it by going and ordering the thing, and you'll be all in the clear. And everyone will think better of you, and they won't know that you're really a failure. Does anyone else do this? That's usually why you sin, by the way. I mean, why you lie. You lie to cover your reputation. Almost every, it's like 90%. That's what it is. Because your actions don't, don't meet the expectations of your godliness. And listen, just to give you a tip, being a guy who relied on lie a lot to get through life, it's really a dead end. It's much better, even though it's a little awkward, to say, no, I forgot. I'm sorry. Wow, that's just a lot easier. So just do that, okay? It's just a, yeah. And then people understand that you're faulty and you're not what you look like you are and that they are sort of like you as well and there's, there's hope for all of us because our failures are covered by Jesus and that's why we need him. It's a much nicer place to be. So stop lying to each other and I'll stop lying to you. Okay, anyway, uh, bad, bad. Prodigal son. Uh, um, we had another example with Abraham a couple weeks ago. Remember, God said to Abraham, leave Ur, leave your life over here in Ur. And Abraham says, so where are we going? Well, I'm not going to tell you, but we're going to go that way. But what you're going to have to do is leave this life behind if you want to find new life with me here. And if Abraham would have said, well, can't we just have new life here? I mean, can't you just add this new life you're going to give to me while I'm living in Ur? I mean, doesn't that make a lot of sense? I'll add you, God, to what I do in life and everything will be better here in Ur. And God says, no, it's a totally new life. If you want this new life over here in Canaan, you're going to have to leave Ur. So really the whole justification process, trusting in God's promise of life to us, always, always entails leaving this to gain this. It's not a matter of adding things to our life. It's a matter of disposing of one life so that God can create a new one. That's always what it is. And that's what he's saying right here. So we know this about paths. So what's the new path? Verse 5. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So what's our new path? I put it in yellow to make it easy. 
united with Christ. That's our new path. Our new path used to be me alone, all about me, every man for himself. I'm going to do what I'm going to do to make me happy. It's all about me, 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 mine, 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 me, 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 mine, 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 mine. This is a dead end. Now it's life with Christ, with Christ, life with Christ. Life comes from relationship with Christ. And, and when we look at the relationships that we have in life, some of them are good, some of them are bad, but at the end of life, more people tell me when they're near the end of life that the greatest parts of their life that were life-giving was relationships with people. So we already know relationship is life-giving in a way that nothing else is. Relationships are more life-giving than all the wealth in the world. Really? Can I just try that? They really are. They're precious. They're precious beyond words. And if, the, if we already know that from a human perspective, think what life is like united with Christ, who is the most attractive, the most amazing man who ever walked, who people, he would walk through towns and, and it would just attract crowds of people who said, I want to know more about him. I want to be wherever he is. I want to be united with him. And that's what this life with God is all about, united with Christ. So that's the new path. So if we are united with him in his death, that part of me dies, then I'll also be united with him in a resurrection, this new life. Verse 6. So we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would be long, no longer enslaved to sin for one who has died has been set free from sin. So he's just, he's just hammering this home. You've died with Christ. You're united with him so that he can bring you new life with him as well. This old person died that was easily susceptible to sin. In fact, so susceptible you were enslaved to it. You had no choice. When sin called, you jumped and you said how high. That's what life was like. It's why when we talk to people who, don't, who haven't made this decision to be justified with God through what Christ did, if instead we go to them and say, well, I can give you a five-point list of how you need to improve your life, it won't go very far. It'll make just superficial changes. Something deep down has to die in the old man so that it can be replaced by a new man. And that's, that's really it. So when I talk to people who are in those kind of dire straits, I say, you know, I could give you some tips about living life and the problems that you're in right now and how you got there and all that kind of stuff. I could give you some easy to-do list things, but I, but I always say, but I, you know what? I got to tell you, what you really need is life with Christ. And that's not just a truism. That's, that's a, a gigantic shift in perspective. I, I've told you this before, but it just amazed me. There was an evangelist by the name of Luis Palau. He comes from South America, and he I uh, would go around and do like Billy Graham kind of evangelism events in big stadiums and stuff like that. And what Luis would do, very interesting, is he'd go into a town where he's going to do one of these events, like a Billy Graham event, and, uh, and for the week before that, he would usually see if he could do a live phone-in telephone show, uh, television show where people could call in and ask him any question they want before the actual event happened. And so you have a lot of unbelievers calling, you know. And they would, they would call, and I, they, this happened once, I think it was in Spokane, where we used to live. And I thought, oh, great, I'm going to tune in. I want to see what Luis Palau tells people when they come in with impossible problems. And that's what they do. They come up and say, well, Luis, you know, I'm going through a divorce right now, and, and uh, this is bad, and the children, and, uh, and, and they just paint this horrible picture of life just going down the toilet. And I'm thinking, wow, Luis, what are you going to say in the next 30 seconds to someone who just called in? And he would say, you need Jesus. And I go, ha, what? <laughs> what? What? Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. And they'd say, "Great." Okay. And then he'd tell them how that can happen. And then he'd get another phone call. And they'd tell another parallel story of doom and despair and horrible. And then, I mean, it's just horrible stuff. And I'd say, "Oh, this is a good one, Luis. I know what I'd tell him. I'd tell him, you know, get counseling for this." And, and Luis says, "You know what you need? You need Jesus." Hey, wait, wait, wait. And he did that the entire evening. And I thought at the time, well, that's kind of a cheap shot. No, it's actually the best shot. Because, because what Christ does when we come to God and find justification through what Christ did is we find that that old self is crucified. It dies with him just as real as he died on the cross. And something radically creates space so that he can bring totally new life. Not just renovated life. Totally new life. And that's what people need. So I always start, and I'll always put my first emphasis with people who are in need to say, I got to tell you, 
What you, who you really need is Christ himself. You need a transformed life in him because he will do something beyond words to change this old life of yours so that it can make space for the new life. What does that look like? Well, I could give you stories of hundreds of people who I've seen this happen. And it's, and it's often very radical. And it's, it's beyond words and beyond any counseling dimensions you can ever think. It really is real. I'm not just telling you stories. It's really real. So that's what he's talking about here. Our old life was, self, was crucified, and that self no longer is enslaved to sin. That is, it no longer responds when sin says sin, because it's dead to it. La, 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 you're dead to me. You're dead to me. And you can literally hold your hand up to sin and say, you're dead to me. I'm dead to you. This, this is over. We're done, this enslavement to sin. We're done. I'm tired of you. You are a dead end, literally. I'm tired of you. I have a new life. And that new life says, you're a dead end. I want life with Christ. United with him. That's the new path that you choose. He goes on, verse 8. Now if we've died with Christ, we believe that we'll also live with him. Yeah! We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin. Once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Now what he does, we're united with. So if he died to sin, sin no longer has any kind of influence on him and no longer can bring death. We're united with him. We share that. We share that new relationship with sin and death. It's no longer effective. Still present, still threatened, but no longer enslaved. And now we find life with Christ. So if he raised from the dead, you can be confident that if you let this part die, there will be new life in raising. That's what he's saying. It's that radical. This is not a five-tip plan about how to reform bad habits. It's the death of the body that did the bad things and replaced with new. It's that radical. It's that radical. Verse 11, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You're dead to sin. But I still sin. I know, but it doesn't do this marionette puppet thing to you anymore. When it wants to make you sin, you can say no. You can also say yes, but the strings have been cut. Now it appeals from a much more weak position. And you can still say yes, and you'll still get to the end of it like a little mini prodigal son episode and say, what was I thinking? This is a dead end. And I always knew that. And life with Christ from this point on after you're justified with God, this life is an increasing amount of saying that over and over and over to the things that classically easily appealed to you. The things that you thought had the best chances of bringing life apart from God. And those things appealed to you so long, many of them we never get a chance to really pursue. So we can't actually get to the point where we can prove that they're dead ends, but they still call to you. And now we can say, you're a dead end. His grace is still sufficient. And when we sin tomorrow, it's still covered. Doesn't give us license to sin. But what the fascinating thing in this whole transformation, because remember I said this last half of this section is about transformation. It's not only transforming the actions of sin in your life, it's actually transforming your love for sin in your life. It's transforming the, the appeals of all the other paths and avenues that seem to be good bets for bringing life and to gradually say, that's a loser, that's a loser, that's a loser, until at the end of life you say, you know what, there's only one path to life. It's from God. Why didn't I do that 20 years ago? Why did, I have to, why did I have to learn by the experience of following these false paths that there is no life in there? And God, being very gracious to us, gives you a book with lots of clues about bad paths. <laughs> now, you can choose to believe his assessment of the bad path and not go there, or you can say, well, I think that experience is the best teacher. And you can pursue him yourself and say, oh, why didn't I believe God in the first place? Really, really. That's, that's what that's all about. Let's push on. So today, right now, what do I do? And this is the end of this section. What do I do tomorrow? Tomorrow's Monday. We're going to go out and we're going to be faced with the decision to sin or not to sin, to appeal to the siren call of the sin life that our old life used to just come up and say, I must do this, Master. Now, what do you do on the, on the day when sin's there again? And you can, you can elect to choose a path away from God. What do you do? So he's going to give us some concrete things. So here we go. One, two, three. Verse 12. Number one. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Can you make that more practical? <laughs> Reigning is a king word. You can let things rule your life. 
When you open the door to those things, you, they rule. So what he's saying is that, you know, you're no longer enslaved to these things. It's not like sin and death is now your king and you have to obey what it says. You don't have to. So when it knocks on the door and it presents a path that says, you'll find life right here, you don't have to let it rule anymore. You don't have to let it reign. You actually have the ability in Christ to say no, which you didn't have when you were enslaved. I mean, that's radically good news. You can say no. Don't let it rule. Don't let it reign. Because it's no longer king. It's no longer king. The king is king. And now you're freed from that enslavement connection that you inherited from the genetics of Adam. And you can say, nope, this is my path. That's a dead end. And you can say you don't reign. you got no place to tell me what to do. And that's what I do when sin knocks on me. I say, you, do, you have no place to say to tell me what to do. You can present the opportunity, but I can say, go away. And through the power of the Holy Spirit in you, it goes away. <sighs> I've seen people who are in the pits of despair, of enslavement to things like drugs, sexual addictions, a whole bunch of other stuff. And when they came to God, they said, God, take this away. I no longer want to jump when it says jump. And God says, okay, you're free from it. And there's real freedom. What happened? We got some people here. What, what happened? It's miraculous. So the connection to, to sin, what I call the marionette strings of control, the reigning of king sin that brings you to death is cut. And now you can say, dead end. So don't let it rule because it doesn't, it, 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 sometimes it, it tells you it's still in charge. Have you ever heard this from sin? <laughs> it says, you know, you might as well do this because you're not going to be able to resist. You know, you might as well just get this out of the way and uh, indulge for a little while, soup it away, you're good. Because after all, I'm bigger than you are. I've always been bigger than you are. Just give in right now. We can get this out of the way and be done with it. You, say, you can say to it, no. You don't have that position anymore. You have no right to tell me what to do. I've chosen my path and you're not it. Go away. Go away. By the way, did you know, did you know that in the book of James, in the letter to James, you know, did you know that if you resist the devil, you know what he does? <laughs> he runs away. So I'm just saying, you don't have to let it rule. And when it tries to lie to you to say that you have no control to, to resist it, say, I do, I'm redeemed, I'm a son of the king, get out of here. And it runs. Number two, don't present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. That is, don't actually literally say, here I am, use me, Mr. Sin, and do that. You, you present the members of your body to do certain things whether it's your eyes or your ears, your hands, you present to, to be used by it. You no longer have to present yourselves to sin to be used by it. You no longer have to be its marionette. You don't have to be its puppet anymore. Don't present yourself to it anymore. You, get, you actually have the choice because you're not enslaved. Number three, but instead, present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Yeah! And your members to God as instruments for righteousness. So it's no longer just about saying no, 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 no to sin. It's about saying yes, 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 yes to God. Now this is very important. This is very important. It's a, it's a thing I call displacement theory. That sounds pretty engineering-like. <laughs> cool. The whole idea is that I, I can only say no to certain things for so long and then I'll eventually give in to it. But if I say no to something because I'm saying yes to something else, it displaces my ability to say yes to the bad thing. I'll give you an example. This came up this last week. <coughs> when I was working in industry, someone ordered a prostitute for me to influence me to make a business decision for them. <laughs> I know, it's crazy. I never saw her, but it's, it's a weird, it's, a, it's another story for another day. But if, if this prostitute had shown up, instead of me just saying no to the prostitute, what I'd have to say is no to the prostitute because I say yes to my wife. It's a displacement thing. I say yes to her, and I've made my choice to say yes to her. And she's not a dead end, but you are. But unless you say yes to something else, your no's will usually fall away. So what I've done in my life in a bigger sense is I've said yes to God, and then the stupid dead ends I can easily say no to. Because I can say, well, there's no space. I've given all that I am to him, and I'm expecting everything from life for him. So I'm sorry, no space for you, and you're a dead end anyway. Bye. I say yes to God. So in the moments of temptation, and temptation will come where the false paths try and pull you away from God, you need to say to it, I'm sorry, 
Well, I'm not sorry, actually. <laughs> I'm proud of the fact that I've said yes to God instead because he's the source of life. What you're telling me right now is a lie, and I have found life in Christ with God, and that's sufficient, and that's my portion. I'm done. Go away. So I'm just saying that. So if you, if you, do, have, if you do have real problems, I mean real rubber-meet-the-road problems with resisting some sin, Take the moment to do what he says right here and say yes to God fully and say, no, all of life comes from you. I'm not going to listen to this. And that's actually a very good way to resist sin. It's really, really good. For sin will have no dominion. Again, it's a king word. Sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under the law, but you're under grace. And so we've been brought in the presence of God. He is now our source of life. The old man has died, united with Christ in his death. The new man has displaced it, and now we have new life in him. And now the old influences on our old life that died don't have dominion rule anymore. You don't rule here. Goodbye. Goodbye. So let me just wrap this up. If the penalty of the law is all that restrains you from sin, remember how we started this? If grace, if grace abounds bigger than sin, why not just sin your head off? And if it's the absence of the penalty that stops you from sin, then there's something tragically wrong in your understanding of salvation. It really is. And we're going to talk about this more and more as we go on because you really don't quite get it just yet. But I'll complete this now. We'll, we're, we'll keep working this over the next week. If the penalty of the law is all that restrains you from sin, then the love of the law has not been written on your heart. The law does condemn us because we don't do it. But the law also is the most lovely thing we have ever seen. I mean, Matthew 23, 23, Jesus comes to the Pharisees and says, what is your problem? Which in New Testament Greek is woe to you. <laughs> what is your problem? You spend all your time tithing mint and dill and cumin, very powerful and expensive spices, and you tithe these things. I think I need to take a tenth of my cumin reserves and give them to God. You spend all your time tithing mint, dill, and cumin, and you neglect the greater parts of the law. Like what? Justice? Faithfulness? Mercy? The things that are really attractive to us. The things that we love about who God is. Our heart falls in love with God and it falls in love with His law. And if it's just the penalty of the law that's a specter that keeps you from, from sinning, then there's something wrong with you. And that's what Paul's trying to get at in the next couple chapters. There's something wrong. If it's just lifting the penalty that keeps you from sin, Something's wrong. And let me give you a view to the future. The, the law written in our hearts? Well, check this out. From the Old Testament, he talks about the new covenant, and here's the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 33. I will put my law within them, and I'll write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So who are the people of God? The one who love his law so much that he's written in their hearts and it's something they love. So again, if just lifting the penalty of breaking the law is what's keeping you from sinning. We've got to talk more. You've got to continue reading in Romans because what we're finding in this transformation phase after coming to God is that he's creating in our hearts a love for his law. And so as lawlessness presents itself to us, more and more we say, that's stupid. That's a dead end. That, that's not lovely. That's horrible. It masquerades as lovely and sweet. It masquerades as self-fulfilling. But in the end, it's actually a complete dead end. So how do, we, how do we make this change where we start loving the law and loving the characteristics of God in the law? He writes it in our heart. So from a very natural perspective, and Paul will go on with this, from a natural perspective, this new life that he's created in our life, that he, that he, he took this old life and killed it with Christ and he displaced it with this new life, this new life is a life where he is genuinely writing on our hearts a love for him and a love for the law and we find our appetite for sin decreasing naturally not because we ought to but naturally and the, the issue i use all the time is driving down main street at 75 miles an hour and it says 30 right here i think right 30 
40 down there. Whoa. But 30 right here. So if I drive in downtown at 30 miles an hour because I say, well, that's what the law says. And if I break the law, they'll throw me in jail. The penalty is just not worth breaking the law. So since the penalty is there, I guess I'll drive 30 miles an hour. However, this is not fulfilling my life and my need for speed. But I'll do it anyway because I'm a good citizen and that's what I ought to do. And then one day, the best thing in the world happens they take down the speed limit signs. There is now no speed limit on Main Street. And I finally can fulfill my dreams and being fulfilled in the loveliness of my life and pursue the life of my need for speed. And I go down Main Street at 75 miles an hour. This is great! And my hair is flying out the window and I kill someone in a crosswalk. He's going to say no. Yes. I love going on 30 because I love preserving the lives of people around me because that's something he's written on my heart. I drive slower because of the love he's written in my heart. It's very natural. We already know about this. So as he goes on from this section, you can read ahead if you want. I won't mark it against you. (laughs) The life with Christ now, united with him, is changing our appetite for sin, increasing our love for the law because it's justice and mercy and faithfulness. It's great stuff that we write novels about that's so lovely. And he's incorporating it not only in the actions of your life, but in your heart that drives your actions. And then suddenly you're a transformed person and God looks at you and says, people of God, right there, people of God. They love the things I love. They do the things I do. They're the result of me changing their genetics. They've been separated from the old man, contaminated from the DNA of sin of Adam, and now I have remade them and written my law in their hearts, and they love me, and I love them, and they're my people, and I'm their God, and they drive 30 miles an hour because they love people. And that's what the Christian life is, changing us from the inside out, not ought to, ought to, ought to. New life. Old life, crucified with Christ. So he's going to continue this theme because you just got to remember, it's a radical change of life. It's not a Dale Carnegie training course how to imitate Jesus. It's a radical change of life, one for the other. United with Christ in his death, united with Christ in his life. So go on sinning after the price has been paid? Are you crazy? Didn't that die? Yeah, it did. Okay, let's pray. Father, what an amazing passage this is. And we are so excited. I'm so excited about the fact that this new life with you is one that you take control of. Maybe in a sense we're enslaved to you now instead of that old stuff. But we find life in you. And we we hear the echo in Jesus' words where he says that I'm the way and the truth and the life. And in this short walk we've had with you already, we've come to understand that it's true. There, there is life in you. And not just life at resurrection at the end, but there's life in you right now. There's life in you right now. And you've changed us as a result. So God, I pray just very practically that tomorrow, or maybe in the next 30 minutes, when we are enticed to sin and it makes its appeal to us that we will be fulfilled in its pursuit away from you, I pray that you'd remind us of these very practical things about displacing that life with a chosen life with you, to to re-up basically our commitment to you and say, nope, I've made my portion God himself and not this because I found that there's only life in him. So go away. So Father, I pray you just give us that understanding. Give us the understanding of of the presence of sin in our life and the, the increasing distaste that we have for it because it's just not about you. It's about us and it's about Satan and it's about junk and it's about dead ends and it's about eating with the pigs at the end of life. But there is only life with you and that buoys our hearts. That encourages us. That gives us hope for tomorrow to know that we can enjoy the life of God not just when we die and we're resurrected but starting tomorrow morning and in the next 30 minutes as we say, God, you and you alone are my portion for life. Thank you for killing the old man and thank you for making me born again with the new man. And now let's do life together, God, united with Christ. So thank you for all this. What an amazing, what an amazing message this is. 
And we pray that through your spirit, you would bring the mechanics to bear in every decision and every way we walk and in the next minutes of our thoughts and our actions that we might enjoy life with you exactly the way you designed it. So thank you for your great loving kindness and calling us to yourself and adopting us as your children and wiping our faces in our hands and looking in our eyes and saying deeply, I love you and I've always loved you and allow us to enjoy that. So thank you now and we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.